All right, hello and welcome back for more human physiology. So in this video, we are set to wrap up our discussion on chapter two. Uh, so the last thing that we have to discuss is to complete our discussion on macromolecules. So we talked about carbon skeletons, functional groups, and all that good stuff uh, in the previous video. So let's dive in and start talking about the types of organic molecules that we expect to find that, that make up cells. So let's start with carbohydrates. So carbohydrates are a type of organic molecule that tends to contain carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. And the interesting thing is that these three atoms occur in a somewhat predictable ratio. It tends to be for every one carbon and one oxygen, you get two hydrogens, so CH2O. So every carbohydrate for the most part is going to be roughly some multiple of that. So carbohydrates are going to be very hydrophilic, and as you will see here in just a second, that makes sense because you're going to notice quite a lot of hydroxyl functional groups that litter the carbon skeleton. So if you look at these carbohydrates here, like glucose and fructose, galactose, deoxyribose, and ribose, as I was mentioning, you see quite a few hydroxyl functional groups. That will make these carbohydrates hydrophilic because since these uh, functional groups are polar, water will want to interact with them. So these are the sorts of things that will not have any problem dissolving in bodily fluids. Okay, so the other thing that we mentioned in the previous video is that building complex and large biomolecules is done by building polymers, and carbohydrates are no different. So the identity of the monomer that we have to work with is called a monosaccharide. So monosaccharides are the monomer that we can build very complex carbohydrates out of. So think of building a big chain using these monosaccharides. So the five types of sugars that you see here, like glucose and fructose and the like, these are all monosaccharides. And monosaccharides, if you're looking at them like this, they tend to look like either hexagons or pentagons. Those are kind of the most common types. And as such, that's because monosaccharides will generally contain either six carbons or five carbons arranged in a ring structure. So... When you perform a dehydration synthesis to join two monosaccharides together, the resulting molecule is called a disaccharide, mono meaning one and di meaning two, so it makes perfect sense. You have joined two monosaccharides together to form a disaccharide. So some examples that you're seeing here are sucrose, which is just uh, a glucose and a fructose joined together, lactose, which is a glucose and a, gala a galactose joined together, and maltose, which is just two glucoses joined together. So the interesting thing here is that when you perform a dehydration synthesis to forge a chemical bond in between two monosaccharides, that covalent bond that you have formed is kind of special. In the case of carbohydrates, we call this covalent bond a glycosidic bond. And the reason why it is special is because, because of the kind of unique geometry of the monosaccharides, these glycosidic bonds can exist in quite a number of three-dimensional configurations. So for sucrose there, it might be a little hard to use your imagination for this, so I'll try to guide you along. For sucrose there in the top right, that glycosidic bond, the oxygen that is in the center of the bond, is actually below either of the two molecules. For lactose, the glycosidic bond starts on the bottom and rises to the top, so that leftmost monosaccharide is actually below the other monosaccharide, so kind of think of holding two, your two hands side by side and then raising one above the other. And then for maltose there, that glycosidic bond is actually even in a plane with both of the monosaccharides. So glycosidic bonds come in a number of different varieties depending on the types of monosaccharides used and the three-dimensional configuration in which they exist. And as such, breaking a glycosidic bond is going to generally require a very specific type of enzyme. So you may find that one type of enzyme may be perfect for breaking one type of glycosidic bond, but not others. And we will see a very good and very specific example of that here in just a little bit. Right, and you can form 
quite a few different types of disaccharides by mixing up the types of monosaccharides that you are joining together. But just bear in mind, the chemistry behind how the dehydration synthesis works is not really going to change no matter which type of monosaccharide you decide to use to build your disaccharide. So once you start really forming a polymer, you have the disaccharide and then you start linking more and more and more monosaccharides onto it, you start to build complex carbohydrate polymers. These are called polysaccharides, poly meaning many. So these are going to be carbohydrates that contain three or more, usually a lot more, monosaccharides that are joined by glycosidic linkages. So this is the polymeric form of the carbohydrate. And as I mentioned previously, really, theoretically, you can make these just about as long as you could possibly want. And in some cases, like in the cases of starch and glycogen, as you can see there, you don't necessarily have to restrict yourself to just building it in a big straight linear chain. You can actually uh, branch chains off to make very complex looking structures. So if we start with starch here, starch is a very common method of storing up glucose in plant cells. So starch is going to be something you see in things like potatoes and things like that. So uh, it's going to account for potatoes having their kind of sweet flavor to them, right? So when we eat plant material, we are able to digest the starch because we have an enzyme that can break those glycosidic bonds to free up glucose for ourselves. And then we can use that glucose in cellular respiration to make ATP for ourselves. So if starch is the way that plants store up glucose, then glycogen is the way that we store up glucose, us being animals. So when we kind of have too much glucose for more glucose than we really know what to do with, we can build glycogen by taking some of that excess glucose and linking it together. And then we can store that glucose either in the liver or in skeletal muscle. And then we can tap into it in cases in which we need the glucose by using an enzyme that breaks those bonds and frees the glucose back up. Now on the far right here, you are seeing cellulose. So cellulose, you're gonna kind of notice has a lot more kind of rigid geometric organization to it. So cellulose is absolutely digestible by a lot of animals that eat plants, but for some reason, humans are not able to digest cellulose. Why do you think that is? So, if you've kind of had a second to think about this, the answer, the reason why we can digest something like starch or glycogen is because our cells possess enzymes that are capable of breaking those particular glycosidic bonds. But I mentioned on a previous slide, you might remember that one type of enzyme that can break one type of glycosidic bond, it may not be able to break another. So the reason why we as humans cannot digest cellulose is because we do not have an enzyme that is capable of engaging that particular type of glycosidic linkage. So this isn't going to really be any surprise, but the major purpose of carbohydrates in our cells is that they're very high energy, so we can digest them, break them apart, and harvest energy out of them through cellular respiration. There are some kind of unconventional roles for, uh, for carbohydrates, so we will see some of these later on in the semester or even later on in this chapter, so in glycoproteins and nucleotides. So we'll see nucleotides a little bit later in this video. But like I was saying, the major purpose is we use carbohydrates for energy. So general idea being we obtain carbohydrates through the diet, and then we are able to break down those polysaccharides into monosaccharides by using our enzymes to break those glycosidic linkages. And then the monosaccharides are absorbed into the bloodstream and delivered to energy needy cells for making ATP by cellular respiration. So carbohydrates are not the only source of energy in the cell, so we can also use proteins and fats for energy. But the nice thing about something like glucose is that every cell in the body can use glucose for energy through cellular respiration. We will eventually see later in the semester how something like fats, which are very rich in energy, not every cell in the body is really going to be crazy about using fats for energy, the major example being the brain. The brain really only likes glucose. 
So the nice thing about glucose is that it's something that every cell in your body can kind of feed on, right? To make ATP to store up energy for later use. All right, that does it for carbohydrates. So let's move along to lipids. So lipids are going to be a little bit of a departure from kind of what we've become accustomed to in this chapter. Lipids make up a very, very diverse group of biomolecules, but a conclusion that we can make right off the bat, and once you start seeing some pictures of these lipids, you should hopefully agree, every lipid is going to be very hydrophobic. So these guys are not going to want to interact with water. The reason why I say lipids are gonna be a little bit funky is because they are not actually polymers. They are not polymers in the sense that we can make polymers as long or as complex as we possibly want. So you'll see what I mean as we kind of go along here. So one very com uh, common component of a lipid, not every lipid, but of many lipids, is something called a fatty acid. If anything is going to be our monomer here, it would be the fatty acid, but as you'll see, it's not a perfect uh, correlation. So a fatty acid consists of a carboxylic acid functional group, which we discussed in the last video, on the end of a long hydrophobic heart hydrocarbon chain. So if you look at some of these fatty acids here, kind of on the left side of the screen, you'll notice the carboxylic acid functional groups on each one of these three fatty acids, and then a very long carbon skeleton that is basically saturated with hydrogens, which is why it is hydrophobic. So these fatty acids, you'll notice we have these little OH groups exposed. Those are going to be potential sites for a dehydration synthesis, and it turns out that these fatty acids really like to be attached to another molecule called glycerol. Glycerol is here on the far left. So glycerol, you'll notice, has these little hydrogens highlighted in the blue bubble. So each one of those blue bubbles on glycerol represents a potential attachment site for a fatty acid. So when a fatty acid is attached to a glycerol by dehydration synthesis, and after we have repeated that three times, we end up with what is called a triglyceride. A triglyceride is a glycerol molecule that has been attached to three different fatty acid chains by dehydration synthesis. So there are some similarities here to polymer building, as we have seen before. We are using dehydration synthesis to start building complex molecules, but the difference is because glycerol only has those three attachment sites, we cannot build anything more complex than just the triglyceride. We can't really go any further beyond that. So let's talk a little bit more about these fatty acids. Fatty acids come in two major kind of varieties here. And you've probably heard of them before if you've ever looked at a nutritional fact label. So we've got saturated fatty acids and unsaturated fatty acids. You might have a preconceived notion that saturated fatty acids are kind of bad and unsaturated are kind of good, and you're not wrong about that. But let's discuss exactly what they are and why that might be. So a saturated fatty acid, the reason why we say it is saturated is because if you look at the carbon skeleton, so look at that big long chain of carbons there, you'll notice that every single vacancy is completely filled or completely saturated with hydrogen atoms. So we are basically making this about as hydrophobic as we possibly can. So when we say a fatty acid is saturated, we mean that each carbon atom is attached to the maximum number of hydrogen atoms. An unsaturated fatty acid is going to have at least one double bond in between two adjacent carbon atoms, sometimes more than that. So this double bond in between these two carbon atoms that you can see right here in red, this means that those two carbon atoms are sharing four electrons between them. So that means that each one of those two carbon atoms, rather than binding to four other things, they're instead only going to bind to three other things because you can't have a total of more than eight valence electrons. So for each one of these carbon atoms, you've got four electrons there, and then for this one on the left, you've got six there and eight there. So four, six, eight. For this one, four, six, eight. <laughs> 
So each one of them has already satisfied their octet rule, so these two hydrogen atoms that would be there are going to be excluded. So you can kind of look at this open space here and kind of wonder your, to yourself, well, where are those hydrogen atoms? They seem to be missing. Well, it's not so much that they're missing, it's just there's no room for any more hydrogen. So an unsaturated fatty acid is going to have less than kind of your imagined maximum number of hydrogen atoms because at least one double bond is preventing those hydrogen atoms from being attached. Another implication of an unsaturated fatty acid is that this will often cause the carbon backbone to bend a little bit or to form a kink in the chain. You'll notice that the saturated fatty acid is maintained in linear form. It basically goes straight out with no bending or angling, whereas the unsaturated fatty acid at the point, at the pivot point of the double bond, bends outward just a little bit, and that's going to have some important implications a little bit later on. So, as you saw on the previous slide, because saturated fatty acids are almost entirely linear, they are able to pack together very, very, very tightly. So because of that tight packing and high density, saturated fatty acids tend to be solid at room temperature. So perfect examples of this are butter and lard. These are solid fats at room temperature. Because unsaturated fatty acids have these little kinks, the fatty acid tails kind of space themselves out. So think of yourself in kind of a room. So start, stand up and put your hands down at your side. So if you were in a very packed and tightly packed room, you would be kind of squished in like a sardine. So there'd be a lot of people next to you and it'd drive you nuts. But now stick your hands out all the way out from side to side. So what you're doing now is you are giving yourself some space and basically restricting other people to the area outside your arms. That's essentially what the kink in the fatty acid tail does. It causes the fatty acid to take up more space, meaning that the density of the overall resulting fat is going to be much less. So these types of fats are going to be liquid at room temperature. So oils are going to be a good example of unsaturated fatty acids. Uh, trans fats, something that you've probably heard of before, they're not really around much anymore just because people have kind of figured out and wised up to how unhealthy they are. Trans fats, basically what that means is you started out with an unsaturated fatty acid and they went through an artificial hydrogenation, uh, excuse me, hydrogenation process in which the double bond was broken and then you add back the hydrogens that were kind of quote unquote missing. This was done with good intention because uh, hydrogenated fats are, uh, they taste better apparently. I wouldn't, I, I, I'm not sure I could tell you one way or the other. Uh, they have a longer shelf life. They're less, uh, they're more resistant to spoilage. So it was done with good intention, but unfortunately trans fats are very, very, very bad for the cardiovascular system. So in general, fatty acids are going to be another very good energy source for cells. So like glucose, fatty acids can be broken down in cellular respiration to produce ATP just by a kind of parallel process called beta oxidation. So one very special type of glycerol type molecule like what we discussed before is called a phospholipid. So a phospholipid is a type of diglyceride. So if a triglyceride is a lipid that has a glycerol backbone and three fatty acid tails, a diglyceride is one that has two fatty acid tails. Where the third fatty acid would be, it is instead going to be a special functional group called phosphatidylcholine. So this is going to create a very interesting situation for us here, something that we haven't really seen yet. So the phosphatidylcholine group is highly, highly, highly polar. The rest of the molecule, referring to the fatty acid tails, the two fatty acid tails, they are extremely hydrophobic. So what we have here is this unique situation in which one end of the molecule really likes water and the other half of the molecule really does not.
So this is going to be very important for us in chapter three uh, when we get there, when we start discussing the cell membrane because we're going to find out the cell membrane is made up of phospholipids and this nature of having partial hydrophobic, partial hydrophilic nature is going to be essential to how the plasma membrane is put together, but we don't need to worry about that just yet. Uh, steroids and prostaglandins are two other classes of lipids. Uh, so steroids are lipid molecules that contain four fused carbon rings. So you can just look at this example here, which is cholesterol, uh, and you can definitely tell that it's hydrophobic. We don't really see any polar functional groups, so definitely a hydrophobic nonpolar molecule. So cholesterol is kind of the linchpin in all of steroid synthesis. So cholesterol is the most essential steroid in your body. Don't get the idea in your head that cholesterol is a bad thing. Now, it's possible to have too much cholesterol, but cholesterol is absolutely essential. You've got to have it no matter what because cholesterol is the basis for how we synthesize all of our steroid hormones. You cannot synthesize steroid hormones like testosterone and estrogen and cortisol unless you have cholesterol as your starting material. So it is absolutely necessary in that regard. And we will have a lot more to say about that in chapter 17 when we start talking about the endocrine system and we'll start discussing individual steroid hormone molecules. Prostaglandins are signaling molecules that are derived from unsaturated fatty acids. So you can tell that's the case down here because you can see those COOH carboxyl carboxylic acid groups. You can see double bonds, which tells us these used to be unsaturated fatty acids. So prostaglandins kind of do two different things. They can either be pro-inflammatory or anti-inflammatory depending on where those double bonds are located. So you might have heard of things like omega-3 fatty acids, omega-6 fatty acids. So depending on where that double bond is, that's what the omega-3 or omega-6 refers to, where that double bond is located, you can end up with something that is either pro-inflammatory or anti-inflammatory. And of general interest, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs like aspirin or things of that nature usually work by countering the actions of pro-inflammatory prostaglandins. Okay, so that does it for lipids for now. So let's go ahead and move right into proteins. So proteins here, this is probably going to be our longest and most involved discussion on macromolecules. So proteins, thankfully for us, are kind of a return to the norm in terms of they are actual polymers in the same way that carbohydrates were polymers. The difference, obviously, is in the identity of the monomer. With carbohydrates, we built polysaccharides out of monosaccharides. Monosaccharides were our monomer. In the case of proteins, our monomers are called amino acids. So amino acids will be joined together by dehydration synthesis, and we can do that again and again and again in order to build a very, very, very long protein chain. So in the case of carbohydrates, the name of the covalent bond that we form by dehydration synthesis was called a glycosidic bond. In the case of proteins, this is called a peptide bond. And a peptide bond is extremely important because it is actually about one and a half times stronger than your conventional single covalent bond. So it's going to be unusually tough to break, which is a good thing because we want our proteins to be nice and solid and stable and hard to mess with. So you can look at this one individual amino acid here. Amino acids have basically four different parts to them. They've got the central carbon, which is called the alpha carbon, that has an attached hydrogen atom. That's one part. They've got an amino functional group here. That's the NH2. They've got a carboxyl acid functional group. That's the COOH. So when we form a peptide bond, if you'll notice over here on the left, an OH from the carboxyl group will form a covalent bond with the amino group of the next amino acid that is to be joined. So when we form proteins and you look at an amino acid monomer in the protein, uh, 
the amino group and the carboxyl group are going to be kind of occupied because they will be forming peptide bonds from one amino group to the carboxyl group of the next amino acid. The interesting and arguably most important thing here is this R group here, which is called the side chain. Now, don't get it twisted here. That R that you're looking at does not refer to a single atom. If you look at the periodic table of the elements, you are not going to see an element that is abbreviated R. What the R means is that can refer to uh, one of 20 different types of functional groups. It could be a hydrogen atom, it could be a hydroxyl group, it could be a methyl group, it could be a carboxyl group, it could be an amino group. So there are 20 different types of these side chains and that is going to account for the 20 different types of amino acids. Of the 20 amino acids, they all have the other three things in common. They've all got the amino group and the carboxyl group and the alpha carbon. It's the identity of the side chain that makes each amino acid different from one another. So you can see all the amino acids listed here, glycine, alanine, valine, proline, and so on and so forth. You do not need to worry about memorizing amino acids or memorizing their structure or what they look like, so don't worry about that. So uh, what you should kind of be focusing on is what they kind of mean overall for protein synthesis. So hopefully I'll try to make that clear as we go along here. You may have before heard of non-essential versus essential amino acids. So what exactly does that mean? Well, we should accept that all the amino acids, all 20 of them, we do need them all, right? So we need them to be able to build all of our different proteins. Well, 11 of the 20 we don't actually need to get in the diet because our cells can actually synthesize them themselves. So those are called the non-essential amino acids. They are essential in the sense that we've got to have them, but we don't actually need to get them from our diet. They're non-essential in that regard. Whereas the other nine are essential amino acids in the sense that we do not have enzymes that are capable of synthesizing them. So the only way we're gonna get them is if we eat them and get them from the food that we eat. So one interesting little study here that you can do to kind of help yourselves along, I don't want you to memorize individual amino acids, but I would like you to kind of look at some of the different side chains here and just kind of indicate, is this gonna be a hydrophilic amino acid or is it going to be a hydrophobic amino acid? So we are doing this just on the basis of the side chain and nothing else. So don't forget that the amino group, the NH2, and the carboxyl group are going to be covered up when we actually make a protein. So this glycine here has a hydrogen side chain. This alanine group, or this alanine amino acid has a CH3 side chain. So those would be hydrophobic. Whereas something like arginine here has a very long uh, uh, not, uh, amino rich side chain here so we would probably call it hydrophilic same goes for something like glutamine which we have an amid functional group you can see a lot of polarity there aspartate you see a lot of polarity there so it is going to be kind of useful to kind of recognize when an amino acid is hydrophilic and when it is hydrophobic so let's walk ourselves through a little exercise here let me ask you a quick question. How many letters are in the English alphabet? So you probably immediately said to yourself, 26, right? So the 26 letters of the alphabet from A to Z can be joined together to construct words of varying length and with letters in different orders and combination. So if you wanted to say, build a very small word like hi, H-I, that word is only two letters long and you only use two of the 26 letters of the alphabet. If you wanted to make a very long letter like physiology, then that's going to include more letter, uh, a, a longer word length. It's going to include more letters out of the 26. So the whole point here is we can make almost an infinite number of letters in the English language, not infinite, but quite a few of them, based on both the length of the word and which letters we use in which combination. So building proteins is kind of like writing very long words. The difference is that we're using 20 letters, 20 amino acids, and tw instead of 26. So we're going to be a little bit more limited here.
So let's say, for example, I j I'm, you're not going to be responsible for being able to replicate this. I just want to try to blow your mind here for a second. Let's say that I want to build a protein that contains a total of nine amino acids. And I am not placing any restrictions on myself. It can contain any of the 20 amino acids in any order, and any amino acid can be used repeatedly. So I could use just nine alanines together, I could use nine valines together, nine tryptophans, whatever I want, or I can use them in any combination I want. So with this lack of restrictions, I can build this many different combinations of proteins. Well, what the heck does that mean? 20 factorial divided by 20 minus nine factorial. So that is about 61 billion different combinations for a protein that is only nine amino acids long. And here's the other thing that is kind of mind-blowing. Most human proteins are not that short. Most human proteins are well over 100 amino acids long. And there are estimated to be about 20 to 30,000 different types of proteins in humans. So that tells you out of billions and trillions and quadrillions of different possible combinations of proteins, in humans, there are only about 30,000 that do us any good. The others have either been cleared out by evolution over time, or when they're made, they're just totally non-functional. So a question that we're going to want to clear up as we move forward how is it that we have all these different combinations of proteins and only about 30,000 of them are actually good and functional for us? Well, the answer to that in the short term is that it all has to do with protein folding. So once you have actually built a protein by joining amino acids together by dehydration synthesis into a long linear chain, you have what is called the primary structure of the protein. This is all well and good, but the primary structure of the protein doesn't really have any function. All the primary structure tells you is how long is the protein and which amino acids does it contain. So in order for proteins to have any sort of function, they have to fold into a particular three-dimensional shape in order for it to function the way that it's supposed to. So you have the primary structure up here. So in this case, in this picture, we are picturing a protein that is 11 amino acids long with each little uh, joint connecting the little purple balls here being a peptide bond. So this is the primary structure. So you're imagining taking your protein and stretching it out in a long straight chain. So the protein is going to go through a number of different structures as it folds into its final configuration. So we start with the primary structure, and then we are going to start getting hydrogen bonding in between the R groups or the side chains of functional groups on nearby or sometimes even far away amino acids. So as we kind of twist the protein strand around, we can get cases where hydrogen bonding can occur. So here you can see hydrogen bonding existing between A1 and A5, two amino acids that are three amino acids away from each other, A2 and A6, A3 and A7, A7 and A11. So we can start to bend the protein into a shape, and this shape is starting to be stabilized by a network of hydrogen bonds. So that can kind of hold the protein in this first shape here. So overall, as we kind of make our way through this folding process, uh, as protein synthesis is completed off of the ribosome, something that we'll talk about a little bit in chapter three, uh, separate types of proteins called chaperones will oversee this folding process to make sure that it all goes okay. So I mentioned that as we move from our primary structure to our secondary structure, the secondary structure being stabilized by hydrogen bond forces, the secondary structure can either take the form of an alpha helix, which you can see right here on the left, or a beta sheet here on the right. It's just going to depend on which amino acids occur in which order and which is going to be the lowest energy configuration for that particular protein. The rest of the molecule will begin to further fold back and interact with other segments by more hydrogen bonding or by what are called disulfide bonds, which is a special type of covalent bond in between two sulfur atoms. If we back up just a little bit to take a peek at our amino acids, you'll notice that there are two different amino acids that contain sulfur. These are going to be 
cysteine right here and da, 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 where is it uh, methionine right here so sulfur there sulfur there disulfide bridges or disulfide bonds are forged between two cysteine amino acids so if a protein contains more than one cysteine you can potentially get these stabilizing disulfide bonds which should cause the protein to become a little bit more rigidly folded into its shape after all of this has occurred, you end up with the final folded uh, structure of the one individual protein, which is called the tertiary structure. So to be clear here, the tertiary structure, which we're kind of highlighting down here, that is the final fully functional folded shape of one individual protein. So if that's the final shape, then what the heck is a quaternary structure? Well, a quaternary structure is not something that refers to one protein. It actually refers to many proteins. So a quaternary structure refers to multiple individual proteins that have already folded into their tertiary structure. They all kind of conglomerate together to form this huge multi-protein complex. Perfect example of this on the far right is hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is not one individual protein. It is actually a conglomeration of four individual proteins that are each in their tertiary structure, and they all come together to form this quaternary structure. So hopefully at this point you're kind of appreciating that the shape of a protein is arguably the most important aspect of its function. So when a protein folds, it takes on a three-dimensional configuration and certain things can fit into different parts of the protein depending on kind of what the shape is. So proteins doing what they are meant to do is totally dependent on them maintaining their folded shape. If a protein loses its shape and unfolds, this process is called denaturation, and it's actually something that we referenced back in chapter one. The most common cause of denaturation is excess temperature or possibly a change in pH. Other types of chemical agents can do it as well, but what we referenced back in chapter one is the reason why you don't want to crank up your body temperature too much is it will cause your proteins and enzymes to kind of fall apart and denature. So once a protein is folded into its final shape, it can take two general types of shapes. A globular protein is gonna kinda look like a big sphere, so myoglobin here is kind of a good example of that. Globular proteins tend to be very hydrophilic, so these are gonna be the types of proteins you find dissolved in bodily fluids. So the reason they are hydrophilic is because their hydrophilic amino acids, the ones that have the hydrophilic R groups, those are going to be the ones that are exposed to the surface. Any hydrophobic amino acids will be buried towards the center of the protein so that they are hidden away from water. So really, if we go backwards here for just a second, this is basically the whole nature of why a protein folds into a certain shape. It does so to expose the hydrophilic amino acids out towards the water, out towards the bodily fluid, and then the hydrophobic amino acids are buried in the center so they don't have to encounter the water. So a lot of protein folding is just to make sure that we accomplish those two very specific things. So fibrous proteins are usually going to be fairly hydrophobic. They tend to contain a lot of hydrophobic amino acids that are exposed on their surface, so we don't really like these things to be exposed to water too much. So collagen and keratin are good examples of this. So the question here is if proteins are made of different combinations of amino acids that are polymerized and folded in particular ways, why are some folded proteins hydrophilic and some are hydrophobic? So you should hopefully kind of understand this based on what I've been saying. If a fibrous protein is hydrophobic, it's probably because there are so many hydrophobic amino acids, we just can't bury them away. A hydrophilic protein is, like we said, able to expose its hydrophilic amino acids on the outside and hide its hydrophobic amino acids on the inside. So while we're on the subject of proteins, let's bring back our good friend, the enzyme. We've already covered enzymes in this chapter, and what we said about them is that an enzyme is a catalyst that speeds up the rate of a chemical reaction by lowering the energy of uh, activation. So most enzymes, not all, but most enzymes are going to be proteins. 
So each metabolic reaction, whether it's a dehydration synthesis or a hydrolysis reaction or something else, every type of metabolic reaction will have its own unique enzyme that takes care of and catalyzes that one particular reaction. So this picture that you're seeing right here is a very good exercise in appreciating how critical the shape of a protein is to its function. So look at this enzyme here that's on the far left. Enzymes in particular have these special catalytic binding pockets which are called its active site. You'll notice these active sites have kind of a particular shape to it. One of them looks kind of rounded and one of them looks kind of triangular. So substrates, which are the reactants that a enzyme especially binds to, one substrate may be perfectly shaped to bind to the active site of an enzyme while another may not. So this is how enzymes achieve their specificity. They only bind to certain substrates because it's only those substrates that can fit into that particular three-dimensional active site. So in this case, we have our two substrates, S1 and S2. They are both perfectly shaped to fit into this active site, so they do so. I had mentioned that most of what an enzyme does is it forces two uh, reactants to come together, so we force S1 and S2 together, we forge a chemical bond between them and create our product, and that product is then released from the enzyme. So this chemical reaction that you see catalyzed here could not possibly have happened if those substrates were shaped a different way or if the enzyme was shaped a different way or, goodness gracious forbid, if the enzyme had denatured. It would not have its shape and would not be able to catalyze the reaction. So yeah, so a substrate is just the special name we give to reactants that interact with enzymes. And the active site will contain important amino acid side chains that actually participate in the chemical reaction itself. So this is about all we're going to say about proteins for now, but believe me when I say we are far from done talking about proteins. Proteins are going to be absolutely the biggest heavy lifters inside your cells. They do everything. They do everything that relates in some way to a physiological function. So just to give you some examples of sorts of things that proteins do, some types of proteins are channel or carrier proteins that function in transporting molecules from one side of a membrane to another, say from the extracellular fluid to the intracellular fluid. This will be a big subject in chapter three when we get there. Some proteins focus on cell recognition, so this will be something that we talk about when we start talking about blood typing and why certain people of certain blood types can give to other people but not to others. Uh, some proteins focus on cell-to-cell -cell communication. These are called receptor proteins. We will talk about these very much so when we start talking about communication, the endocrine system, and the nervous system. We've already seen enzymes here, and then junction proteins will be something that we start talking about when we discuss tissues in chapter four. So a lot more to look forward to on proteins in the future, but we've talked about them quite a lot at this point, so let's give ourselves a breather and finish off this video by talking about nucleic acids. So nucleic acids, again, are a type of polymer, and they only really come in two varieties, DNA and RNA. So DNA, you hopefully understand as the storage unit of genetic information in humans, while RNA in humans is going to play kind of a more ancillary role. It plays a lot of roles in the synthesis of proteins. It's not really there so much to store genetic information. It's more kind of a bridge between the DNA and the eventual protein that we are going to make by using the DNA as the blueprints. So as I was mentioning, a nucleic acid is a polymer that joins monomers together, and these monomers are called nucleotides. So for carbohydrates, our monomer was the monosaccharide. For proteins, our monomer was the amino acid. For nucleic acids, our monomer is the nucleotide. And as always, we are going to form our polymers by repeated rounds of dehydration synthesis. So every nucleotide, so this is our monomer, every nucleotide is going to contain three different parts. 
Number one, it contains a pentose monosaccharide. So that's one of those monosaccharides that looks like a pentagon. And this is either going to be ribose or deoxyribose. Number two, the nucleotide will contain a negatively charged phosphate group. And number three, it is going to contain some nitrogen-containing base, whether it's adenine, thymine, cytosine, guanine, or uracil, will just depend. So if you look at the structure of a nucleotide here, you can see all three different components. You can see the phosphate, the pento sugar, and the nitrogenous base. So the good news here, if you thought proteins were a bit of a headache, and I wouldn't blame you if you did, Proteins might have been a headache because there were 20 different types of monomers. Thankfully, with nucleotides, there's only five different types of them. So adenine, thymine, cytosine, guanine, and uracil. So when joining two nucleotides by dehydration synthesis, we are forming a covalent bond between the phosphate of one nucleotide and the sugar of the next nucleotide. And as we build our polymer longer and longer, this is going to create a backbone of alternating sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate. This backbone is called the phosphodiester backbone. You'll notice that the nitrogenous base is not involved in the polymerization, so it has a tendency to kind of hang out to the side. So if I use my mouse here to trace the backbone, you'll notice that those bases are just kind of hanging out, not exactly... Uh, perpendicular, but they're kind of hanging out to the side there. So when many nucleotides are joined like this to form a very long polymer, we call this a single strand of nucleic acid. So RNA, ribonucleic acid, is always, almost always maintained as a single strand like this, whereas DNA is going to be a double strand. So RNA's nucleotides are always going to use ribose as the incorporated sugar, whereas DNA will use deoxyribose. It's in the name. And finally, RNA is only going to use four out of those five possible nitrogenous bases. It will use adenine, uracil, guanine, and cytosine, and you will notice it does not use any thymine. Whereas if we look at DNA, DNA... Uh, has a tendency to pair up with another complementary strand of DNA, and this is going to cause it to become double-stranded. So when we talk about complementarity, we're talking about all the kind of Chargaff's rules that you talked about and discussed in general biology. So A goes with T, C goes with G, and all that. So we're not really going to get too crazy in that. It's, there's not really too much purpose in talking about that in a human physiology class, but it wouldn't be terrible if you were at least aware of it, right? So DNA nucleotides will use deoxyribose as their sugars, and DNA does use thymine. It just does not use uracil. So it says here that in chapter three, we will discuss complementation rules. I meant to take that out, so we are not going to discuss that in chapter three. So if that was kind of making you nervous, don't, don't be nervous. We're not going to discuss complementation in chapter three. I should have taken that statement out. So to kind of summarize uh, what we talked about with nucleotides and uh, nucleic acids up until this point, if you are comparing DNA and RNA, you can compare them on three different things. So let's go backwards here. D on whether they're double-stranded or single-stranded, DNA is double, RNA is single. What type of sugar do they use? DNA uses deoxyribose, RNA uses ribose, and what types of bases do they not use? DNA does not use uracil, and RNA does not use thymine. So the last thing for us to discuss here is we want to kind of bring ourselves back to ATP. ATP, which we discussed in the previous chapter, is a special type of nucleotide. It's special in the sense that it does not contain one phosphate group, it actually contains two. The extra two phosphates, which are highlighted here with their chemical bonds in red, form very high energy chemical bonds that we can break in order to power anabolic reactions. So we talked about all that in chapter one. So the whole purpose of cellular respiration, as we will briefly discuss in chapter three, is that we digest our food molecules, we break them down via catabolic reactions in order to release energy and store it up as ATP and then we can use that ATP to power all of our energy-consuming activities.
All right, so thank you for your patience. I know this was a very long video, but that is going to do it for chapter two. We will go ahead and wrap it up here, and we will pick up next time with chapter three. So if this was a review of a lot of chemistry, chapter three is going to be a review of a lot of your general biology, including uh, cell transport, uh, organelles, protein synthesis, and the like. So we'll go ahead and wrap it up here. I will see you next time.